This is the R Podcast, Episode 1, Introduction. Welcome to the first episode of the R Podcast. I am your host, Eric Nance. I appreciate you checking out this brand new podcast, and please be sure to check out the podcast website, which is at www.r-podcast.org, where you can subscribe to the podcast and read the show notes for each episode. And along with that, there are other helpful resources that I'll explain later on in today's episode. So first, this is an introductory uh, episode for a couple reasons. First, I wanted to introduce myself and also the goals of the R podcast to you. And also, I want to introduce you to the software R, its history, its background, and some of its philosophy. I think this is important to set a good foundation about R itself, and it will set a solid foundation for the future episodes I have planned for this podcast. So my name is Eric Nance, and I've been using R since approximately 2004. I am a statistician in the life sciences industry, and before using R, I had used other statistical software such as SAS and SPSS throughout my statistics courses in college and also my consulting work. When I first started to use R in graduate school, It took a little getting used to, at least from my perspective, because it operates quite differently than what you may be used to if you've used SAS or SPSS before. However, I quickly learned how important R is for data analysis when I began to work on my dissertation. When I had found the statistical methodology that I needed to use for my topic of interest, It was not supported out of the box in SAS or SPSS. As I was conducting my literature review, I discovered that the authors of the statistical method I was using actually had what's called an R package, or extension if you will, that enabled R to carry out the analyses using their methodology, and most importantly, the the way of carrying out those um, analysis methodologies was very similar to the statistical methods that were already built into R. So it was quite easy once I read the documentation of, you know, adapting what I knew about R at the time to use these this new package and perform this new analysis. While it's possible that I could have created a custom macro in something like SAS, to implement the new methodology, the fact that the authors of the methodology already created a specific package that on their own to carry out these analyses was absolutely huge in my opinion in not only exploring the methodology, but also um, actually using it with real data. Ever since that point, I started to learn more about R on my own and it quickly became my statistical computing software of choice for my research. Around this same time, I started to find some great blogs and other online websites that were discussing R, and it really opened my eyes to some of the great applications of R to many different types of data and also different types of statistical analyses. So while I've been using R since 2004, I've discovered that there's always something new to learn, and also there's more than likely more than one way to accomplish a given task. And throughout this uh, podcast, if I ever, or in future episodes, if I ever make, make a mistake or say something incorrectly, please let me know and I'll definitely fix it. And I'll get to how to provide feedback for this show later on. So I have benefited greatly from many of those in the R community, and I kind of look at this podcast as a way for us to learn new things about R together, as well as sharing what I've learned already up to this point. So that kind of leads me into my goals of this podcast. 
So really, the podcast is intended to introduce R and help those that are new to using statistical computing or even those who have experience with other statistical software to understand R and utilize R's unique features and capabilities for all aspects of analyzing data. My vision for this podcast is to first set really a solid foundation for the basic concepts behind R, as these can be a bit of a struggle for those who have not used R before. Along the way, I'm going to highlight some of the great tools and resources I have used to increase my capabilities and productivity in using R. As many of us know, we're kind of in a golden age of having massive amounts of data from many different sources available for analysis thanks to, you know, great advances in technology, not the least of which is, of course, the Internet, and also the ways we can actually collect data. So I plan to use real-world data that's freely available as practical demonstrations of using R for data analysis. Now, given that R is a statistical computing environment, I think it's very um, appropriate that, of course, as I teach, as I show how I've been using R, there is going to be, of course, some discussion about statistics itself. But as I kind of mentioned already, we are in this age where data is everywhere, and it's really important that that we highlight some of the great statistical methodologies that can be used to really make sense of these data. So while I'm not going to aim this podcast to be lectures about statistics, you know, in general, however, I, through my approach, it will be really learning through example of using these statistical methodologies to accomplish, you know, novel statistical analyses and, and interpreting data. And so with that said, early on in kind of the episodes of this podcast, I would imagine it's going to be geared more to the beginners of statistical computing and also beginners of using R. But of course, along the way, my hope is setting this foundation of some of the basic concepts. We can get into some really innovative and perhaps somewhat advanced uh, techniques and applications of using R as well. And also for the topics that could use more of a visual demonstration, I plan to not only offer, of course, the audio as far as a podcast is concerned, but also I will plan to make what are called screencasts that will actually show, you know, a visual of using R for specific, you know, demonstrations. So with that, I think it leads into nicely, what exactly is R? So as I mentioned before, R is a statistical computing environment. Specifically, it's a programming language, if you will, that's tailored to data processing, statistical analyses, and visualization of data. One of the nice features is that R is available cross-platform, meaning it's available for Windows, Mac, Linux, and Unix operating systems. So, of course, most of us know that R is not the only statistical computing package. And as I mentioned in the early part of the episode, of our software includes things like SAS, SPSS, Minitab, and also S or S+. We'll actually bring that up a little bit later in the episode, among others. But one of the main differences between R and these statistical competing packages is that R is free and open source. The word free actually has a couple meanings here. First, it is free as in no cost. Hence, if I want to use R and download it, there are no license fees, no payments are necessary at all. But not only that, it is also free, as in free to actually look at the source code that actually produces R. I will explain this concept when we get to the main topic of this episode, which is the history of R. And if you have not seen R before, you can visit www.r-project.org and you will find all the information about R itself as well as how to install R for your operating system of choice. So out of the box, R comes with everything you need to import data, perform data cleaning and manipulation, produce statistical models and inferences, 
and visualize the data with a wide variety of publication quality graphics. In fact, R is recognized to have vastly superior visualization capabilities than most other statistical software right out of the box. But another feature that separates R from commercial software, uh, statistical software, is the ability to download add-ons, which are called packages, that provide new functionality to your existing installation of R. This is just like when I was talking about my dissertation research and finding a specific package tailored to the statistical method I was using to analyze the data for my research. So like R itself, these packages are available for free along with the ability to access their source code. At the time of this recording, there are over 3,000 packages available for download. That number still amazes me to hear that so many new extensions to R are available for all of us absolutely for free. And these packages offer many new capabilities, some of which include, say, new statistical methodologies created by prominent statisticians around the world, or also more innovative visualization techniques, and also the ability to process many types of complex and highly dimensional data. Many of these cutting-edge methodologies often show up in R long before commercial statistical software. So the ability for the community to create these add-on packages and have them freely available is just one of the reasons you often hear R referred to as a de facto standard for the development of statistical software. It may sound like a cliche, but for the majority of statistical methods, both traditional and novel, as some of you may relate to, there's a package for that. Just like how often you hear for, say, Apple software, there's an app for that. It's really, R is amazingly having so many capabilities offered via these add-on packages. So as I've described R, let me also describe why I'm such a big fan of R. So really, to me, the ability to perform robust and innovative analyses and visualization should not depend on solely access to proprietary commercial software that often have high license costs. I think making sense of data and providing quantitative evidence that demonstrates, say, a hypothesis, you know, an answer to a hypothesis, is a vital, you know, capability for every industry in today's world. And as I mentioned, data is available practically everywhere and it's easily accessible. So really having R serve as, in essence, an analysis toolbox to not only get the data imported and then also conduct, say, innovative research statistically, having this program do everything at once for me is really a time saver and also it saves a lot of cost obviously because R is absolutely free. And really as I think of, you know, educating the concept of statistics or even just data analysis in general, having a great package like R available you know, this gives capability of students in, say, high school or even earlier on that have an interest in learning statistics. You know, having R available is a really nice way to teach these new concepts and then use it with real data. And again, available with no cost. And another really nice feature that I've been using more in the past few years is the idea of reproducibility. And this means a couple different things. So, with the way R works, users really can create what are called scripts or in essence programs that detail every step in say a statistical analysis or even data processing. And having these kind of commands, if you will, saved into a file, it obviously promotes reproducibility later on. If you need to tweak a certain step in the analysis, it's quite easy to do. This is, in my opinion, a great advantage over some of the statistical computing that are more what are called what you see is what you get editors, or in essence where you point and click through menus and options. But also, R has a great ability to interact with other pieces of software. And one of the really interesting applications or interactions 
is this concept of what's called reproducible research in that we will explain this in future episodes, but basically R has the ability to embed actual R code into, say, the document you are writing and then the ability to compile those analyses and those interpretations as you're generating the actual report so that you don't have to, say, copy and paste from, say, R's output to, like, a another document or re or report that you're writing. It's all contained in the same functionality, in the same, you know, interface. And it's really nice to have if, say, you're going to refresh your report with, say, new data, and you don't, and all you have to do is basically load that new data and rerun the same methods you were using, and the updated results will be already compiled into your final report. To me, this is a really huge advantage, and really a, ours ability to, in, in, you know, influence this directly, I think will really promote the concept of what's called reproducible research and make it more feasible for researchers around the world to use R effectively to accomplish this task. And, you know, there are actually a lot more reasons I like R, but of course, my hope is throughout this podcast and really this journey of demonstrating R, you'll really become apparent some of the other, you know, reasons I'm such a big fan of R itself. So with that, I think it's ready to get to the main topic of today's episode, which is the history of R. So R's history begins in the early 1990s at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Dr. Ross Zahaka, who was a professor in the university's statistics department, and still is, was impressed with a statistical programming language called S, as well as an interpretive language called Scheme. In an interesting coincidence, a professor who was on sabbatical from the University of Waterloo named Robert Gentleman met Ross at the University of Auckland, and it turns out they were both interested in developing a statistical computing environment that could be used to teach introductory statistics. In 1992, they began to develop an interpreter, if you will, based on principles from the aforementioned software scheme and decided to call it R since both of their first names began with the letter R. It used about a thousand lines of C code, and for those of you who don't know, C is another kind of programming language that is still used today, actually. And since they were adopting a similar syntax as that other statistical computing software called S, they adopted, they kind of used the name R as almost, well, at least in my opinion, maybe a, a kind of linkage to its roots of using S as well, or S syntax, I should say. So in 1993, they completed the initial version of R, and they released the binaries on Statlib which was and still is maintained by Carnegie Mellon University for distributing statistical software and data. One of the key pieces of feedback they received was to release the source code for R as free software. So Ross and Robert were weighing their options, and in 1995, they decided to release the R source code under the Free Software Foundation's GNU General Public License. Now, unlike commercial software, the GNU license allows anyone to, in essence, look under the hood, so to speak, by accessing the source code to build that particular software, in this case R. This decision ultimately will take the development of R to a whole different level, as you'll hear later on. So now that R has been released under this free software license, a GNU general public license, Ross and Robert received many more, in essence, bug reports or, you know, flaws in the software and also proposed fixes from colleagues around the world that are now using R. And so they created a mailing list that would be hosted 
at the University of Auckland to really assemble all of this feedback. Well, over the span of the next year, they received many bug reports and suggestions, and it really becomes clear that this solution of hosting this mailing list at the University of Auckland would not be viable in the long term. They got some um, feedback, and basically uh, Martin Mockler of ETH Zurich, who ironically was also the key person that urged them to release R under the GNU public license, he volunteered to use resources at ETH Zurich for hosting automated mailing lists that could have discussions about R and R development. So by 1997, three of these, in essence, news groups were established. R Announce, R Help, and R Devel. So now there is a more robust way of capturing the feedback that Ross and Robert were receiving about R. And along those same lines, it was this, they really needed to form a better distribution mechanism for sharing R with the world. So a formal archive was established at TU Vienna by Kurt Hornick and Fritz Leisch, and this also served as a repository for the user contributions to R itself. So many users contributed patches to the R source code, as well as requests for enhancements to R. Ross and Robert quickly realized that they could not implement these changes to R at the rate of feedback at the rate the feedback was coming in. So in mid-1997, they established a core group of talented developers who, along with them, could make changes to the source code. Once this group was established, this is another kind of key step in which many new enhancements were now contributed to R itself. So now uh, we're going to flash forward to February 29, 2000, and that's when R version 1.0 was released to the world. At the time of this recording, we are now on version 2.14.1. And while I didn't use R in the very beginning, as I mentioned, I started using R in about 2004, it is absolutely amazing to see how the software has continued to evolve, not only in the basic installation of R, but as I mentioned, the staggering amount of these add-on packages that are now available to accomplish so many new capabilities and new statistical methodologies. It's truly amazing to see all this happen really with the efforts of, you know, a community support. And when I talked in the earlier part about the decision to release R under the free and open source license, that decision right there, I think, was really key into letting R become this almost go-to standard now of implementing new statistical techniques and statistical software in general. It's really amazing to see how important a community is to the software, you know, enhancements and how R has become really so popular in the data analysis, you know, community. So I hope this, this little brief, um, expert of the history of R really puts in perspective how far R has come. So if you visit our website, www.r-podcast.org, you will see a set of show notes for this particular episode, and I put in there links to a lot of documents that I use as reference to describe the history of R. And so if I stated any part incorrectly, and I'd imagine I've probably mispronounced some names already, just please let me know and I'll be sure to correct it. So with that, um, to wrap up the episode, I'd like to talk a little bit about the website itself and how you can interact with us at the R Podcast. So as I'll mention once again, our site is located at www.r-podcast.org. And when you go to that page, you will see for there will be a post for each episode and there will be a post for this episode and as I mentioned you can kind of see the show notes and often I'll share some resources that I've used to compile the show's material and then when we start getting into talking about 
actual you know program code in R. I'll often share some experts of programs that I've used to you know illustrate some concepts. And then of course, if there is a screencast for a particular episode, that will also be in another post as well. On the main website, you are also going to see a few tabs at the top. There will be a tab called About, which will kind of also introduce kind of the goals of the podcast, as well as a brief introduction to myself as well. I also have a tab for resources in which I've compiled a, a selected set of resources that have really helped me, you know, learn R. And I still use these resources to this day as they always teach me kind of something new or refresh my memory on how to accomplish a certain task. On the main website itself, you will see on the right-hand side a few links for how to subscribe to the site. We have a site, a main site RSS feed, and that stands for a real simple syndication that you can put into your aggregate RSS reader of choice. For me personally, I use Google Reader as it's really, you know, easy to use. And that way you will, you will have any updates to the site will be directly implemented via that RSS feed. I also have links to, to subscribe to the actual podcast episodes themselves. We plan to be on iTunes as one method of subscription choice. At this time, I'm not on there yet, but hopefully we will be there, you know, within the next few days after recording this episode. So that would be one option to subscribe to the actual podcast episodes. Another option is to use the podcast RSS feeds, they are in both MP3 format and also OGG format that you can put into your favorite podcatching software. I've used software such as um, Amarok in the past or um, Rhythmbox, and I'm also aware that there's some nice podcatching software even on the Android operating system that would probably be very useful to, to get show updates as well. Along with that, there will also be an option to subscribe via email as well. Um, you will just type in your email address in the, in the text box on the right-hand side and click on subscribe, and then you will receive updates to the site via email as well. As far as getting in contact with us, you can send me feedback at um, our email address, which is the rcast at gmail.com. That's T-H-E-R-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. You are welcome to provide feedback via email using this. And also, there we have another method of, of leaving feedback, and that's using our voicemail feed as well. So you can leave voicemail feedback using our, our actual Google Voice number, which is one two six nine eight four nine nine seven eight zero, and as I mentioned, this is a voicemail feed, so don't expect me to actually answer it in real time. But if you would like to leave audio feedback, this would be the way to go, and I will definitely respond to feedback, both of course via email and also via audio, on future episodes. So I really encourage you to pass along any feedback. Perhaps you have a topic suggestion, perhaps if you want to make any corrections on what I've stated in the episodes, or any other type of feedback, I really welcome that interaction. And that's kind of one of my other purposes for the podcast, is to really interact with the community in general that's using R. As I've been, as I mentioned, I think the community has really helped me benefit so much of learning R and actually using R effectively. I really look forward to interacting with the community, and this show is kind of like my way of hopefully kicking that off. On the website, you'll also see links to some of my favorite kind of blogs or other sites that talk about R extensively. And um, I think that's about it for now. And then keep in mind that the website is a new venture on my part, so there may be some things that are tweaked and maybe added down the road. So pardon the dust, if you will, if I make any new enhancements along the way, or if I change something along the way. I'll be sure to let all of you know in future episodes. 
So with that, I think this first episode, this introductory episode is going to wrap up. And I really appreciate you uh, downloading and tuning in to this first episode. And I really hope that you stay subscribed to us and listen on to future episodes as I'm really excited about where I want to take this show and also, like I said, interacting with all of you in the community. So with that, I think this first episode is wrapping up. So until next time... End of line. <laughs>